the Republic of Georgia and India who fought during the war in Afghanistan. He tells their stories and looks at what they mean for the future of war and the American empire in his recent book called Under Contract, The Invisible Workers of America's Global War. He's also written two previous books on Afghanistan, uh, the first derailing democracy in Afghanistan, elections in an unstable political landscape, looks at how elections actually undermine democratic values in Afghanistan after the initial US invasion. And his first book, Bizarre Politics, Power and Pottery in an Afghan Market Town, explains how in 2006 to 2008, uh, various lineages of potters and other craftspeople worked together to maintain peace, even while the insurgency grew rapidly in neighboring districts. Noah has also published numerous articles and reports for a variety of think tanks in Washington, D.C. and Kabul. So thank you so, so much again, Noah, for being here and for your great paper, and uh, you can go ahead. Thanks so much, Stephanie, and thanks to the Cost of War Project for really this excellent and important work that you guys are promoting and providing a platform for. Um, and, and thank you all to the attendees uh, for being here and uh, thinking about these pressing uh, concerns, I think even, even more pressing, considering yesterday's uh, announcement by President Biden in particular. Um, also, quickly, I would like to thank uh, the Holling Center, Bennington College, and No One Left Behind, who helped fund a lot of the research that I'm presenting on in particular today. Um, in total, I've been conducting about 150 interviews over the past five and a half years of Afghans who are at various stages in the SIV program, either thinking about applying, applying, and those who have applied and arrived here in the United States. So uh, while there's been a, a good deal of scrutiny on this program, and there's been um, several uh, good internal government reports on it, all of these reports really focus on the bureaucracy of the program itself. And there's not been attention paid to the actual lived experience of how does this process work on the ground? What are the actual repercussions for Afghans living in Afghanistan? And what are the repercussions for those um, who make it to the United States or who don't make it to the United States and end up someplace else? Um, and that's really one of the things that I, I'll be focusing on, on today. Um, and I'll just say, because Stephanie uh, brought up uh, my first book, which focused on a, a group of potters in Afghanistan, those potters lived only about uh, half an hour down the road from the, the base you can see in this initial slide here. So really, my personal interest grew out of knowing Afghans who, uh, particularly during the surge, increasingly would go to this base to seek out employment. Um, and as I got to know them and to hear uh, some of their struggles and thinking about the future of Afghanistan, this really uh, uh, became quite personal for me in a lot of ways. Uh, but let me jump quickly into uh, some of the key findings, which um, you can find in the report as well, and I think um, might not be um, entirely surprising for some of you who are familiar with it. Um, other reports have highlighted the fact that the program is painfully slow. Um, processing time of applicants right now, our applications are two years, but it takes applicants a lot of time to gather the documents um, and the applicants need to respond and attend interviews at various stages, which really results in um, a three to six year uh, process um, for those that are successful. Um, and oftentimes it can be three to six years and then ultimately they're denied at the end of that process. Um, currently, there are over 18,000 uh, applicants in the pipeline. Um, those are the ones that have been submitted. And I've certainly talked to many more Afghans who have thought about applying or are now too daunted to even apply. Um, but there is an overwhelming caseload um, sitting, waiting to be dealt with right now. The application process is also, frankly, incredibly confusing to applicants. Um, and applicants are intimidated by the process. Um, the steps the State Department has taken pains to lay out on their website, um, but frankly, it does not translate well um, to the Afghan context. Also, um, it shows some of the chaos and the disorganization of um, various American organizations in Afghanistan at different points. So, for instance, the U.S. 
maintains no database of these uh, contractors, of these interpreters, of these other workers that have um, uh, worked for the United States or on behalf of the United States. And what that means is the onus is actually on the applicants themselves to prove that they were in these positions. Um, some of them can do this by um, contacting a boss or a supervisor, but others have real problems doing this um, because their boss or supervisor has moved on, um, because this was a job where they work primarily in person, so they don't have an email address. Um, and then if you're stuck in Afghanistan and your boss is in the United States or your boss is deployed elsewhere, potentially, um, finding that uh, supervisor to get that letter can be um, very difficult for them. Um, at the same time, the program, the program which asks to demonstrate the threat to the applicants um, by, uh, by submitting a statement of threat doesn't then differentiate the threat in any way. So if I am receiving low levels of harassment, I'm finding it difficult to get a job, um, that's one situation. If I'm receiving uh, a, a nightly correspondence from the Taliban that says we are going to come and kill your family immediately, those two cases are treated um, no differently. And um, really folks in these two different positions um, have, have uh, very different decisions to be making, unfortunately. The other piece that's then tied into these various um, bureaucratic regulations is the fact that the program is incredibly inflexible. So it's inflexible about the level of threat. It's inflexible about the level of service. Um, if you've been injured while uh, serving with the US troops, um, you don't receive any uh, special uh, care or attention. Um, and this really ends up uh, becoming quite burdensome for many. Um, just to show uh, one example of how these regulations work, um, right now, if you apply for a special immigrant visa and you receive it, um, you are entitled to bring your spouse and your uh, dependents who are under 18, but not those over 18. Uh, so for example, one of the SIV recipients that I interviewed um, had four children age 13, 15, 18, and 20. Um, and he was faced with the difficult decision of taking two of those children and immigrating to the United States and leaving two of those children behind in Afghanistan. Um, those two children now uh, don't have the support of their family. And as he pointed out, in many ways are actually even more at risk now because now it is well known in the neighborhood that he had immigrated to the United States. And there's also now this assumption for many of those that uh, immigrate to the United States that obviously if you've made it to the West, you must be wealthy, you must have money. And now these children become much more valuable targets of uh, kidnapping and ransom. Um, which we know is one of the, the major problems in Afghanistan, particularly in, in more urban areas. So what does this all result in? Well, this results in a system that really allows for other forms of exploitation. Um, and one of the things that uh, was really concerning to sort of dig into over the years is the way that there's been a system of brokers that have grown up in Kabul. Um, these brokers are oftentimes referred to as travel agents, um, but essentially what they are is if you want a, um, a coaching during the application process, they will coach you on how to submit your application. They will also, in certain cases, write you a threat statement. So you have a sort of industry of forged threat statements that has, has sprung up. And this is intertwined with other forms of migration, um, both legal and illegal, um, that many of the applicants say, well, I'm trying to get a student visa to Australia in case my special immigrant visa to the United States uh, does not work out. Um, and what ends up happening is these brokers who are, are very inefficient uh, but are very good at selling their product, end up um, charging hundreds of dollars to uh, quote unquote support uh, applicants during this process. Um, the fact that it also takes three to six years creates this massive amount of instant, uh, uncertainty, um, particularly for uh, potential applicants who are having difficulty finding work because they work for the Americans. Um, they are potentially unemployed. If they are hoping to leave to the United States, do they sell their land? Do they sell their houses? 
um, what should they be doing to prepare, but because the, the system is not very transparent about where they are in the pipeline um, or whether they're likely to receive the visa in the end, um, they're left in this sort of state of um, economic and social limbo. Um, I mean, for young men, even is it worth getting married at this point? Um, if uh, this doesn't work out, should they flee illegally? Um, should they use these brokers who can often traffic them as well through Iran, through Turkey, um, towards Europe? Um, they're forced to make these very difficult decisions because the process is, is so long. Then for those who make it to the United States, they are oftentimes much more positive about the fact that they receive the visa. Um, but it's important to note that this program really only provides a visa and no other forms of support. So even those who do arrive in the United States are often left um, to very difficult circumstances. Uh, there's, quite there's a large amount of difficulty in terms of finding employment. Uh, quite oftentimes, these Afghans, because they held uh, good jobs in working for the US government, are well educated. Many have advanced degrees from Afghanistan, from Pakistan, or from Iran. Uh, but it's difficult to translate those degrees into uh, work history that, that, that works in the United States. And oftentimes, those skills are simply wasted. The uh, types of benefits that these Afghans are able to apply for are the types of benefits that are available to all uh, refugees. But oftentimes these refugee programs are designed for those who are far less skilled, far less educated immigrants. Um, and this really leaves the Afghans to navigate a system on their own. And because many of them have been employed, unemployed for multiple years, they are potentially in debt. They've potentially um, given up uh, their land um, and they've potentially paid the brokers all of these uh, this money that they're now immigrating to the United States uh, with that additional um, burden on them. So ultimately, what does this mean? Um, well, the program is frankly not um, helping those that need it the most. Those that are currently at the most risk, those that are being targeted um, by the Taliban, by other groups, and that threat is imminent, they don't have time to wait the three to six years for the visa to process. So they're not even applying anymore. Um, if you are in that kind of situation, uh, the odds are that you are trying to get trafficked out of the country in, in one way or another. Um, those who are facing less threat are the ones who have a, the a, option of waiting around and, and seeing if they uh, are lucky enough to have their visa processed. Um, no One Left Behind, which is a great organization that supports a lot of these applicants and re recipients, for example, has um, tracked applicants in 30 different countries. These are all applicants who filed their application in Afghanistan and one way or another were forced to flee the country um, legally or illegally and are, are stuck in limbo um, some of them in Western, in European countries, but some of them in refugee camps, some of them in Pakistan, Iran, um, sort of scattered around the globe, um, still hoping that that visa will be processed, but um, now being displaced elsewhere. Um, and in the meantime, the same group has documented over 300 translators and family members who have, who have been killed. But again, because there's no database for this, really the only ones that we are able to find are uh, the ones that are gain attention in the international press for the most part. And when you start talking to SUV, uh, SIV applicants, you oftentimes hear stories of other cases that, that are not included in this database. So we've done uh, some real uh, work in trying to chase down those um, cases. Um, but the US government has not made an effort to um, collectively study what's happening with, with, these, um, uh, with this population. Um, the, and the real takeaway here is particularly with President Biden's um, announcement yesterday, but even before that, we're at a stage with the SIV program where bureaucratic tinkering is not enough. Um, this is a program that has received widespread bipartisan support. Um, it is a program that has received scrutiny in the past, and there have been attempts to speed it up. Um, and those attempts, and despite those attempts, the process has only taken longer. Um, and now with the September drawdown of, of troops, I think there's a real 
need to start preparing for contingencies. Um, what is the US response going to be if the national government of Afghanistan splinters um, and the, the Taliban are able to return and uh, systematically seek retribution going neighborhood to neighborhood, um, hunting out those who did support the US um, government and the US military. I, I certainly hope that's a worst case scenario, um, but it's a real scenario. Um, that I think uh, policymakers need to at least have a, a response for. And I think the key takeaway from this research is the SIV program is an inadequate response for that. So if we try to rely on that, um, th th there will be tragic consequences. Um, this will potentially be a, be a cleansing that we can see coming um, and, and we need to prepare for that. And on the left here, I've just sort of highlighted, um, these are both host country and foreign contractors in this chart. Um, but we're talking about potentially tens of thousands of uh, Afghans who, who can be targeted um, in, in some of these scenarios. Um, so in terms of recommendations, uh, I really think there is a need to rethink um, support for Afghan allies in light of the US withdrawal. Um, if you look in the report, one of the things I talk about is how this was handled quite differently after Vietnam. Um, there have been other attempts to remove these targeted populations from the country, provide them with a safe haven where we can process visa applications um, and, and simply buy time. Um, more forward thinking uh, recommendations from the report include a, a database of all contractors supporting the US government. The fact that the US government hasn't tracked this um, has really hindered themselves in terms of trying to um, support and trying to deal with the, the problem that in, in many ways is uh, US created. Um, similarly, there needs to be um, any type of visa process like this simply needs to review terms that we use like threat and service. There needs to be a way to differentiate immediate threat um, from uh, lower level threats. And frankly, the Afghans that served uh, the US in Afghanistan did so in very different capacities. Um, I talked to certain interpreters who served um, for literally years on the front line, um, multiple tours of duty um, in some of the roughest areas. And then you have other cases such as um, those potentially who maybe worked in the embassy or had much better, uh, uh, more comfortable jobs. Um, and there's simply a need, there's a greater need for the, the former case uh, to have a visa process quickly than in the latter. Um, and so that leads, of course, to number four, which is uh, differentiating um, between those different scenarios. Um, and then finally, and I, I think this is important, there needs to be greater support in the US, especially in terms of jobs and, and education. Um, this uh, does not need to be a, a large uh, program. Actually, a, a quite small one would enable um, these Afghans to build on the skills that they used in uh, servicing, in serving the US government. Um, I talked to uh, several lawyers at the US embassy, um, a uh, lawyer, for example, who had a PhD from Iran, um, who worked for the Ministry of Justice with the US, uh, with US State Department assistance, um, really one of the most skilled lawyers in Afghanistan. And then when he arrives in uh, the United States, he's now a, uh, an assistant teacher in a middle school. Um, and was grateful for that. Um, but there's frankly just wasted potential um, in not um, doing more to try to find employment for um, these uh, individuals in industries where the, a lot of the contracting companies they work for have offices in the United States. Um, and so uh, some work with those companies could, could go far. Um, and I think I'll leave it there, but just say there are there is more in the report, and I um, encourage you to take a look at it along with uh, some of the other great work uh, that uh, the Cross Board Project has uh, has up there. Thanks. Great, thanks so much, Noah. Um, so really interesting. We have some questions filtering in, um, so I encourage people to continue to type in uh, question, your questions in the Q and A function, and um, I'll get to those in turn. Uh, Noah, just a quick, um, a quick clarifying question, just so we're sure. These are not just um, these are not just translators, right? What kinds of other roles are these Afghans serving for the U.S. military? 
Yeah, uh, that's a great point. Um, uh, translators are a very important population here who I think have received a lot of attention. Um, there's a couple reasons why uh, I think it's important that we, we broaden that scope. Um, first of all, several of the translators I, I spoke with, maybe they started uh, doing translation work and then moved actually into more administrative posts or moved into other positions as they sort of moved up the hierarchy. Um, there's a lot of other, as I said, um, potentially in the embassy uh, support staff there that ranges from cooks and cleaners um, to, to lawyers, um, to HR folks. Um, and again, I think we need to take a hard look at, at the threat to each of these groups, but um, this is a, a very uh, wide array of Afghans who are, are in danger because they supported the, the, um, the US government. Great, okay. Um, so uh, we have um, a question about um, comparing, can you say a little bit more about comparing the current SIV program uh, to what happened after the US withdrew from Vietnam? Um, and also how does the US SIV response for Afghanistan compare to the program with Iraq and in other US war zones? Mm -hmm. um, are the problems essentially the same? Um, there's, uh, I, I don't want to overdraw parallels because uh, I'm an anthropologist and we're uh, contractually obligated to say every situation is, is different. Um, it's important to say, though, that, that what happened in Vietnam was done better than what is happening right now in uh, Afghanistan. Um, part of what makes the Afghan situation unique is simply the um, length of the conflict. Um, and you have some uh, folks that I interviewed who all of their adult life, uh, they, they were either 15 years old or something like that when the US invaded and have essentially worked for the US government in some capacity for their entire adult lives. And they're now in their mid thirties. Um, so this is a much larger population um, than in uh, Iraq where our intervention was deep and we did hire a lot of Iraqis, but you had fewer who were sort of continually employed um, for so long. Um, so that's one issue. But I, I do think um, in sort of academic circles, the idea of trying to find a, a safe haven, an area to defend uh, some of these Afghans has been floated in the past. I, I don't know if it's been seriously discussed in policy circles. I haven't seen any evidence of that. Um, but I think, and not to widen the scope, um, but I think you're also going to see um, the real potential that I think the US and NATO at least needs to be aware of that if there is uh, additional ethnic cleansing in Afghanistan, um, we know Hazara, the, the Shia minorities have been targeted by the, uh, the Taliban brutally in the past. Um, are there certain populations that we uh, feel some moral obligation to protect? Um, could those forms of protection be intertwined? Um, again, frankly, I, I, I'm raising the issues more than the solutions, um, but there are, uh, there are cases where we have been more successful. Um, but if we see this type of cleansing of either um, uh, Afghans who work for the government or, or other groups, um, this is not going to be a, a Rwanda situation where we were sort of on the outside and weren't aware of what's going on. We're going to be very uh, aware of it happening and, and uh, I think need to prepare some responses there. And best case scenario, the national government holds and we're talking about a smaller group of Afghans, but we still have 18,000 applications in that pipeline that haven't been um, uh, haven't been uh, vetted yet. And so uh, re reform on one level needs to happen. And, and what about the idea, uh, what about this, this issue of other war zones? Um, the Biden administration is, is conducting a review, right? Is it looking at just Afghanistan or other war zones as well? What about, you know, Syria and Somalia and places like that? Well, it, Frankly, I, I don't know all the inner workings of how the uh, executive order was interpreted, but it was, uh, they were instructed to look more broadly at, at uh, America's moral obligation in all sorts of different uh, conflict zones uh, that they're currently involved in. And I, I'm very uh, welcoming of that if it's done seriously. Um, right now we're really working on sort of a case by case basis. 
Um, the SIV program was a, set up initially for Iraqi translators and then um, moved over for Afghan translators. And now the Afghan program is much larger than the Iraqi program was um, because of the scope of, of the, the war there. Um, but an awareness of uh, the consequences, uh, as I think the Cost of War project always highlights, the, uh, an awareness of the consequences to these civilians who are supporting military efforts um, is essential globally. Um, and there's things to be learned from the current efforts in Afghanistan and Iraq that I think can allow us to better prepare for um, any other conflicts that the US becomes involved with going forward. Um, also very important notice, and this is some of my earlier research in particular, um, but uh, the US has increasingly over the last 50 years um, move to a model of dependency on, on uh, contracting and outsourcing uh, the labor of war. Um, so in, in Vietnam, you had one in every hundred uh, personnel on the ground were a contractor. Um, in Afghanistan and Iraq, that was one to one. Um, so you have a much larger civilian population supporting these war efforts, both local populations and uh, American and other international um, populations. Um, and uh, a lot of important thought has gone into um, supporting veterans. Um, less support has gone into uh, how do we uh, support some of these uh, internationals and contractors, um, some of whom I think we sort of label mercenaries and some of them are. Um, but I've spent a lot of time interviewing Nepalis and Indians, for example, who participated and supported the US war effort. Um, and one guy who always stands out in my mind uh, had spent 14, he was in Nepali, had spent 14 years doing uh, security work for US bases in Afghanistan. So, um, I mean, the amount of time and the things that he had seen in those 14 years was, was alarming. And, and we're just going to see more of that as, as uh, US intervenes elsewhere. Right. Well, um, someone's asking, um, one of the lines in the report is that as the program is currently constituted, the SIV pro program may be doing more harm than good. Um, so can you expand on this a little bit? Are you suggesting that uh, Afghans would be better off if the program didn't exist at all? Great, great question. And to be more precise, um, I don't think it should be eliminated unless it's being replaced with something immediately. Um, but the argument that it's doing more harm than good, um, essentially right now, if you are um, exposed to certain threats um, for the work that you've done in Afghanistan and you go to the US embassy and apply for a SIV visa or SI visa, um, you become even more of a target than you were previously, because there's now the assumption that you're going to the, to the United States. There is now the assumption that you will um, uh, have additional sources of income, that you have these extra um, connections. So almost every applicant I talked to was doing their absolute best to make sure nobody knew that they were actually applying for it. That being said, that's a very difficult thing to do, particularly when you need these letters of, of support. Um, so a lot of the applicants that I uh, discussed this with were very, not a lot, all, were very aware of, of the risks of the application process itself. Um, and so, um, and particularly since the application process can result in a denied visa, um, many of them were very wary of, of even submitting applications at this point. Um, and, and so that's uh, one of the things I mean about doing more harm than good. Um, there are some cases of um, Afghans I've, I even interviewed who um, had received a visa, went to the United States and had such a hard time that they went back. That's a much smaller population. I think that's not as, as big of an issue, but um, that is something to consider as, as well. All right. Um, this question is about uh, once um, the SIV recipients arrive in the US, um, it sounds like uh, they, you know, it's saying that the same individuals who provide letters of recommendation um, from, you know, the U.S. Army or or wherever to the SIV recipients for their application process, they don't they don't reply to simple LinkedIn requests of connection once they're once they're here, um, and uh, you know the federal government abandons Afghan families once they settle, they become Uber drivers, they're chained to uh, state welfare. How, do, how can we improve this situation? 
Yeah. And it, it is shocking. And I, I mean, on one level, um, I don't know what they would have done otherwise, but it, the, the percentage of uh, Afghan translators I interviewed who became Uber drivers was, was astounding. I mean, it's the one type of employment that's sort of instantly available. Um, a lot of the other uh, re refugee resettlement programs, if they're helping, oftentimes help get them landscaping work or something like that. Um, but it's, it's little better than that. Um, this, this would involve taking uh, several steps back, um, but to me, this is partially about the US government's obligation, but the US government is then um, handing off a lot of these uh, obligations to contractors um, who oftentimes have large working staffs in the United States as well. Um, I would love to see a program that said, if you are receiving X billion of dollars to support the US war efforts in um, the um, in uh, oh, a conflict zone, you are required to make sure that your staff back in the United States is X percent percentage, both uh, US military veterans and X percentage um, potentially SIV recipients or other uh, civilians who have been contracted um, to support those efforts. Um, there's a real, uh, uh, there is a tendency uh, among uh, these contracting companies as is the nature of a contract itself. That contract ends and, and there's no more um, uh, support. Uh, there's no obligation that, that remains. Um, that doesn't mean that the US government in issuing these contracts couldn't write in that type of clause or something like that. Um, but the US offer, the, another uh, direction on this is the US offers funding for refugee settlements, re resettlement to different refugee groups. Um, if they had a targeted stream of funding for SIV recipients that received different benefits than a typical refugee program, you could also then see refugee resettlement groups that were more targeted towards these uh, fairly well-educated English-speaking um, professionals who are coming from Afghanistan, um, and uh, they could work to find them a, a different level of employment that lines up better with their, their skills and abilities. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, so right. The 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 are are there any amongst the people uh, the SIV recipients who who aren't um, these kind of better educated uh, people that you're mentioning? What happens to them? Sure. There's some, um, and because again, uh, the way the program works is if you have this employment history. So I interviewed a, a few people who are in sort of groundskeeper or low level. Um, guard positions at the U.S. Embassy who then immigrated. Um, the problem with the current program is they're, they're then sort of tossed in with everybody else as well. And in some ways, actually, those uh, lower level workers with less, um, uh, with less of a job history in Afghanistan, they have lower levels of expectations around employment. So when they do end up doing a landscaping job, it doesn't feel quite as much of a loss of potential of capital. Um, and uh, yeah, but that being said, um, because these programs aren't very thoughtful in how these, uh, how a lot of this resettlement happens, um, and um, you end up with these other quite odd, difficult to navigate scenarios. Um, so for example, I talked with one guy who had um, eight kids um, and was resettled in uh, suburban San Diego, um, quite a ways away from the nearest bus stop. And, and how do you get around when you have eight kids in suburban San Diego in a very drive uh, heavy area that was not linked to public transportation? Um, the issue that all this points back to in my mind is um, the way we've been approaching this is a special immigrant visa. Um, we're saying that the visa is the solution. We're going to hand a visa and that's going to be it. Um, and I think what listening to even Congress talk about its bipartisan support for translators and others, um, I, I think the, the universal, not the universal, but a strong sense is we are actually have a greater obligation here. Um, and the problem is that this greater obligation is being treated simply with a visa and with nothing else. And I think more thought needs to happen both during the application process and after the application process. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that makes sense. Um, turning to uh, you know some more of your recommendations, um, 
uh, someone's asking about your database that you're suggesting. Uh, it seems like that might, is that a security risk? How do you prevent that kind of thing from falling in enemy hands? This is a great question. And I would love uh, smarter people uh, working on this. Um, but I'll say not having a database doesn't solve that issue either because there are employment roles from each of these contractors, which we do know sometimes have fallen into enemy hands in the past as well. Um, so I do think this is uh, something to be thoughtful about. Um, one of my greater concerns, and this is partially pulling back to thinking about how we think about the contracting that is supporting um, US interventions and wars everywhere, um, is the, the fact that these databases don't exist means we don't even know exactly how many Afghans worked for um, the US military, the US government in Afghanistan and Iraq. Um, we know certain numbers from the Defense Department, we know certain numbers from other or, or organizations at certain points, and they track sometimes the number of employees per quarter, um, but they don't keep track of who those employees are in a permanent way um, or give permanent numbers. So the, the numbers I shared with you were just from the Department of Defense. Um, and again, doesn't tell you exactly how many Afghans were hired there. So there are all sorts of reasons why having a clearer database um, would uh, uh, really be beneficial for us to both understand the impacts of war and assist these different groups. Um, I think there are certainly concern, concern, security concerns and um, associated with it, um, but, but I, I think, um, there's a need to think through uh, that, that process. Mm -hmm. um, and, and what about, um, what about the Afghan government? Are they, you know, how, this qu question is, how do we manage the brain drain from Afghanistan if most of these people are, are professionals and um, isn't the Afghan government obligated to step in and do something as well? Um, couldn't they employ and provide security for some of these people? Yes, uh, a, another great question. And one of, as somebody who spent five years living in Afghanistan has a deep affinity for the country and an affection for many, many people there. Um, I really entered this work um, with a distaste for the SIV program in general, because um, I, I want Afghanistan to be a safe place where Afghans can live and raise children and women can go to school and be employed. Um, and the problem is um, the Afghan government has not shown itself to be capable of doing that. And um, the US seems disinclined to, um, uh, to support it in that process. And I, I'm not uh, necessarily opposed to the, the withdrawal of uh, American troops, um, but there is still a moral obligation in my mind uh, to all of those young Afghans who we said, if you work for us, um, we will help you live in a peaceful democratic Afghanistan. Um, that peaceful democratic Afghanistan doesn't exist and is not going to exist in the short term, in the long term or uh, medium term, who knows what term. Um, and so I think we're left in a place where uh, there are Afghans weekly who are being killed because they helped us. Um, I, I, I wish that situation was better, um, but I think that's the uh, moral obligation that we're, we're up against at, at this point in time. Yeah. Um, I, uh, I'll just say probably last call for, um, for questions. I don't know if anyone has any more, but in the meantime, I wanted to just um, ask you to talk a little bit more now about a point that was striking to me in the paper um, as far as recommendations go as well. It, the, the kind of image that sticks in my head is of, uh, you know, that, that the applicants need to prove their, the threat that they're receiving. Often the only way to do that is to get a, like show a letter, like a threatening letter from, you know, Taliban affiliated illicit groups um, who are, are like a night letter, right? Like, oh, we're gonna hunt you down and kill you. What, I don't know what, what it would say, but, but it, seems, um, it seems a little bit absurd to me that that, that would be a, 
uh, a requirement for um, that there would, you, could, you would have to prove this. It seems like uh, probably the most vulnerable applicants wouldn't be able to do so. So I wonder if you could talk about that particular part of your um, recommendation for the SIV program going forward. Um, absolutely. And I'll say, I, I think because for those of us who, uh, for anyone who pays attention to Afghanistan, you're, you're probably now familiar with the term night letter because they were sort of these notorious notices that the Taliban would, would drop off um, warning a community or warning a, a family. Um, now, in reality, those, those exist and they happen, but not everybody who's being targeted by the Taliban receive a night letter. And that's simply not how it works. This program seems to almost assume that that's how it works. When in reality, for a lot of um, uh, those who are most at risk, this is a, a word of mouth thing. You know, um, my cousin heard from his cousin that um, the Taliban were um, uh, going to come after us, and that actually, uh, and, and so there needs to the, the program doesn't have that uh, is built in with almost this sort of movie expectation of what what the Taliban threat looks like, um, which, and not to jump from point to point, but there's also another concern that was raised in several interviews that I think is worth raising here. Um, similarly, uh, during the interview process, uh, the applicants are polygraphed um, and asked a series of questions to make sure they're not a, quote, threat to the United States. Again, this is really problematic, putting the onus on the applicant to show that they're a threat, as opposed to the, putting the onus on the US government to show that they're a threat. Um, but one of the questions that uh, the applicants in particular always bristle at is, um, do you have any known connections with the Taliban? Um, and the reality of Afghanistan today is everybody does. Um, everybody knows a cousin who has a friend who has a cousin or something like that. Um, and, and these are, this is the network through which a lot of this stuff circulates. And this is how people know whether they're in real danger or not. It's, it's not necessarily a notice that gets dropped off at their house. Right, yeah. Um, so uh, a question around, um, is there a way to link the objection to the US leaving Afghanistan to the attempt to make the SIV program expand and work immediately? That is, are there people in Congress, particularly Republicans, who might be ready to take this on more publicly now? I, 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 I'm not enough of an expert on, on where Congress is on some of these things, but I, I have to say that my hope would be that there could be some sort of connection. Um, and to me, that's maybe why we connected also with the, the Hazara issue um, of here is a community that is very likely to uh, face uh, massive uh, oppression um, in the face of an incoming Taliban government. Um, do we work with the UN to set up a safe haven for Hazaras that is also um, welcoming to uh, SIV applications, applicants? Um, I think there's a, a simpler version that says for everybody who uh, has submitted an application, or maybe there's even a, a brief pre-application, we're just going to airlift them out of the country and drop them off uh, in a, a, a neighboring ally um, and say, we want to house a camp in Kyrgyzstan. Um, and simply process them if, if it really is going to take that amount of time. Um, so I think there's, I, my, my hope is that there is a, a way to, to link those pieces together because I think they are uh, intertwining concerns. I, it's to me, I, I'm not sure exactly where the political impetus lies and the best way to gain traction there. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, and uh, what about, um, Here's a question about gender. Um, can you say more about, it seems like there's a lot of men in your stories, are there, but women seem probably, at, are probably at greater risk economically in terms of their security. Are there any women involved in? Yes, lots of uh, very male dominated, but I did interview uh, a couple of SIV um, recipients who were female and who brought their families with them. Again, very, very uh, small number. I actually um, one, worked with one who was a uh, Afghan um, judge, one of the first female Afghan judges who we pulled out of the country after she spent some time uh, working with the US government and, and faced severe threats. So there are Af Afghan females who fall into this category. I would say in many ways, actually the Afghan females who um, are 
part of the family of male SIV applicants are oftentimes um, on the receiving end of some of the, the, the real um, burdens of this process. Um, if I am a SIV applicant and I'm concerned about um, the safety of my family, but maybe it's a low level concern, um, oftentimes what I might do is say, okay, I just don't want my girls uh, to go out. I will let my boys, they're, they're men, they can handle themselves, they'll go out, um, but I'm gonna keep my wife and my uh, female children here and not send them to school. Um, that's the type of thing that you hear um, quite a bit. Um, yeah, I think, I think that's, that's the, 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 the biggest way that they're impacted. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, uh, is there any kind, is or was there any kind of an anthropological advisory of the SIV program um, during its creation or any of these many uh, government reviews of it um, that have taken into account um, things like, um, you know, written and oral contracts or people, um, uh, people who know about, you know, Afghan uh, administrative organizations or, you know, with the local knowledge basically of, of to my knowledge, no. Um, there, there were certainly anthropologists involved on the military side of things and the human terrain teams that uh, got quite a bit of attention. I, I don't think any of uh, that then uh, looked at the SIV program itself. Um, in particular, the SIV program was very much picked up from the uh, Iraqi um, system and dropped into Afghanistan, um, mm -hmm. which makes me think that it didn't have much um, uh, much uh, input in, and in, in frankly, the, the program does not reflect an Afghan context as the question sort of implies in terms of oral communication and in terms of um, understanding the ways that uh, Af Afghan society is very different than Iraqi society. Um, and, uh, and in terms of, and this pulls back to that question about um, the uh, comparison or the role of the Afghan national government is uh, the, the Afghan national government has, has never really been in a position to protect civilian populations. Um, the Iraqi government was in a much stronger position at, at various points. Um, so uh, yeah, so there hasn't been much, much work done there, I guess. And from what you've told me, Noah, the, um, the, the US government reviews of this program have really been focused on the kind of, you know, intricacies of the bureaucratic inefficiencies and, and taken hardly any, if at all, um, account of the actual stories and lives and, and inter like any kind of interviews of, of the people who would be applying to these, this program, yeah. right? Yeah, and that's absolutely right. And I, I don't wanna totally poo poo uh, some of those reports. I, I, Cigar did a good pro, uh, report looking at the personnel that it takes to staff the SIV program and the fact that there's not enough personnel there. Um, and there's been several studies that go through and look how long each of the 14 steps, there's 14 steps in the review take. But the problem is not how long each of the 14 steps takes. The problem is that there's 14 steps in the right. first place, right? Um, and um, what this, all of these, uh, um, reviews, while they've, again, looked at those 14 steps, they haven't looked at why are some Afghans not applying for this now? Um, what happens to the ones who decide not to apply? What happens to the applications that get denied because they can't find a boss? Um, what happens to that Afghan? Um, and, and again, as an anthropologist, my, my sample sizes are not as large as other studies, but I think there's a real possibility to do much more sophisticated work here and tracking them down, but the US government has not chosen to do that. So one of your recommendations would be that in this current review of the program that's being done, that that that, that, that review include more of this kind of, of interview and research. Yeah. 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 Um, and another question is um, uh, more, you know, partly an opinion. Uh, it sounds like the only requirement of this, this um, you know, getting a, a one of these visas should be proving long-term help to the U.S. or the I, ISAF. Um, that in in and of itself is proof of danger. Um, should we press for that to be the sole meaningful criterion, just long-term long-term help? Yeah, I'm trying to think that through. I think that might be right. Um, 
I wonder also if there is something, I would want something that sort of holistically also maybe considered dependence and considered how much, um, how many, uh, the, there's a very different situation, me as a uh, single man, um, as opposed to a man who's a provider for an elaborate family um, that I might also take into consideration. Um, but the problem is in terms of how the setup of the program, the setup of the program hasn't really seriously had uh, that conversation. Um, so I, I think any type of overhaul needs to consider um, more widely, and, and maybe this gets back to Catherine's uh, question about uh, political impetus here, um, but starting to think through, okay, what are, um, given where the US is in Afghanistan right now, who are the groups that are most in danger going forward? Um, and what kind of support will be provided to them? Um, and, and the answer might be minimal, um, but it needs to be, I think, we, we can't just say we're pulling out and that's that. Um, you'll, in Biden's remarks yesterday, there was very little on Afghans themselves. There was a little bit of, we'll have to see about diplomatic protections. Um, but for, for those Afghans who, who do uh, rely on uh, the security the United States provided, um, that's something that, that needs to be worked out rapidly. Mm -hmm. um, just kind of a related question. Um, were, uh, some, uh, Dr. Lutz is, is wondering, if, is there anyone in the audience who might be able to make a suggestion on where the political traction in Congress might lie for providing solutions to this problem? Um, we would welcome we would welcome uh, hearing about any of those ideas and 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 helping uh, you know making making those connections. So feel free to um, send us an email at um, costs of war at brown edu. Um, and uh, it, it's I think you know one of the one of the really um, uh, important things about Noah's paper is the fact that it is so. Um, so it's, it's kind of like a, a, a small concrete way in which the U.S. can act on its moral obligation to some of these people. It's a, it's a, it sounds to me like it's a program that, you know, could be reviewed much better and, and that there would be policy uh, experts who would be able to make some really concrete suggestions about how to, how to improve the program. So it seems like um, an element of research that, that really, um, you know, we, we should be able to, to do something about um, very concretely. So um, thank you, Noah. I don't know if you have one last um, thought to add uh, before we wrap up. Um, no, only to reiterate, I think, uh, some of my um, earlier statements about this is a really sort of crucial time. Now that the decision to withdraw troops ha has been made, there are uh, elements in Biden's statements that talk about a strong diplomatic work. Um, I think all of us who have watched and paid attention to uh, the U.S. over there need to be pushing for, for that type of diplomacy um, vigorously in the coming months. And, and some of that is going to be for interpreting or for um, protecting uh, interpreters and other groups like that. But um, the, the pressure needs to be kept up to make sure that that happens. Great. Um, well, thanks. Thanks again. This is a great paper, a great presentation, um, really important issue. And thanks to all of you who, uh, who stayed for this presentation today. I hope it was useful and please don't hesitate again to reach out with any further questions or comments or suggestions. Um, it, again, the email address is costs with an S of war, costs of war at brown.edu. So thanks a lot and um, have a good rest of the day. Thank you.